Let's kneel and pray this morning. Many years ago, a famous singer sung the words, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Just like the ones I used to know. Unfortunately for many of us in Mississippi, a white Christmas in terms of snow is probably not going to happen this year. But Lord, in a more spiritual sense, the color white symbolizes purity and cleansing. prophet Isaiah said many years ago, though their sins are like scarlet, they shall be made as white as snow. The cause of the birth in the manger many years ago by Jesus and his sinless life and satisfactory death on the cross for our sin and subsequent resurrection, we have hope today. We don't have to dream of a white Christmas, but Lord, we can experience a redeemed Christmas every day of our lives if we have the hope of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we look around us, many are searching for that hope. They're searching for meaning and structure to this lost and dying world. May we never keep Jesus to ourselves as a private Savior. May we take those who are wounded and bleeding and crying out for hope. May we take them to the same cross where we too found peace. That they may join us and solace there. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This time of year for many Southern Baptists is an exciting year. Not simply because it's Christmas time, but also because it's the time we begin giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Now, some of you may not know who Lottie Moon was. I'm going to share briefly her story in a few moments. But the Lottie Moon Christmas offering allows foreign missionaries all throughout the world to tell people about Jesus Christ. And every single penny, dime, nickel that you, you sacrificially give, you and I sacrificially give, it goes directly to foreign missions and people all over the world hearing about Jesus Christ. I'd like you to look at a video this morning of several of two of our missionaries who are presently serving in another country. Gentlemen. The message of Jesus Christ is of the utmost importance and many places in the world just, they simply do not have access to that message. So uh, my family and I, that's, that's our commitment, is to go to places where Christ has not been preached. As a mom and a grandma, we've tried to teach our children that to follow Christ means to follow Him completely, to be willing to give up, to be willing to sacrifice whatever it takes. But the day came, um, our baby son, we got a phone call in the middle of the night and he had been in a, a really bad car accident. Him and our daughter-in-law were in surgery, and I was that morning outside hanging out clothes on the clothesline, and an airplane flew over. And I can remember thinking, oh, Lord, please let me get on that plane so I can be there and I can see my son with my own eyes. That was a hard time, a hard time in our life because we wanted to be there for them, and we couldn't. But, you know, just shortly after that, I watched this old, old woman climb from the valley all the way to the top of the mountain where we were teaching and she barely made it, and her name was Mema Busa Busa. I remember um, the day that Mema Busa came to Christ, and at that moment I knew that no matter what I had to sacrifice, it was worth it. The story of King George is a long story with many ties to the Lottie Moon Offering and Cooperative Program. It was just an exciting time in our, in our ministry to see the miracle of an old man in our culture come to know Jesus as his Savior. I 
can remember his grandmother at her lowest moment in life heard the story of a savior. Will you go and worship Jesus with me? That afternoon in the village, she accepted Christ. She continues to be faithful in our Bible studies and learning um, how to share Christ with others. And you know, if, if you wouldn't have given, and if God wouldn't have allowed us to go, we would never have been a part of her story. And because you've given, you're a part of her story in providing um, a way that she heard the truth of the gospel and now she follows him among the mountain Basuchi. And so no matter the cost, no matter the sacrifice, my family and I have decided that it's worth it and that we'll climb the mountains as long as the Lord keeps us physically able. And uh, as we do that, through your gifts, uh, Christ is exalted, the name of God is made great, uh, God is glorified through His plan, through His eternal plan of Christ being exalted through, to the nations. I watched that video several times this week and cried each time I saw it to see people who were lost but when presented the gospel they responded even in an older age which by the way in our culture is, is an almost an impossibility. Last year Tracy our treasurer shared with me that we took the largest offering ever for the Lottie Moon offering. It was well over $5,000. This year our goal, friendship, is $6,000 for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. You say, Brother Brian, I just don't feel like I, I have any extra money to give this year. I, I have so many gifts to buy. Let me challenge you to do this. Purchase the greatest gift of all. And that is sacrificially giving somebody the opportunity to hear about Jesus. Something that you and I take for granted so often. In the pew in front of you, you'll see envelopes. If you don't see an envelope there, bring one from home. You can come to the church office and we'll gladly give you some. But you designate on there Lottie Moon. And not one cent of that will go to the ministry of Friendship Baptist Church. But every single cent of that will go to international missionaries who are telling people about Jesus Christ. I challenge you to give and to give sacrificially and prayerfully what God would lead you to do with His Holy Spirit from your heart. Open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and the Word was proclaimed, one might say. When you find your place in John 1, would you stand as we read verses 6 through 13? There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. I want you to understand this morning that Jesus has not only sent John, but he sends you and me to the ends of the earth, as he would have said in Acts 1, so that all peoples might believe. Our God is not a God who simply wants a few select individuals to be saved or to think that they're saved. Jesus Christ gave His life, shed His blood so that a white Christmas of redeemed life may be experienced by all. Now John himself, verse 8, was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. I want to stop here and say this to you. If you've ever known a pastor, you've ever heard a preacher, you've ever read about a preacher who thought he was a great man, but you know what, who thought, you know what, this guy must be equal to God. I want you to know something. He was not. No preacher, no man is ever the light of the world. Only Jesus is the light of the world. And you and I are to bear witness to Jesus and to His work. Verse 9, there was the true light 
being Christ, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. And one of the great verses in all the New Testament, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. May God honor and bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. The word was proclaimed by people. Our text tells us that there came a man from God. His name was John. If you go back to Mark chapter 1, Mark 1 gives a little bit more background information on John the Baptist as we would affectionately term him. And John the Baptist, the Bible says in Mark 1, 4, came from the wilderness or he appeared in the wilderness. But I submit to you that John the Baptist simply did not appear in the wilderness as a foreigner. He did not appear from the desert, if you will. John the Baptist, more or less, was speaking to people who were in a spiritual wilderness in their own lives and existence. As a result of this spiritual wilderness in which people were in, John the Baptist called people to a baptism of repentance for their sin. He called them to change lives. He said, look, You can't grow closer to the Lord living like you're living. You need to grow closer to Him through a changed life. There was also a man in the Old Testament. His name was Isaiah. He was a prophet. God asked the question, Isaiah 6, 8, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? No one answered, but Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. I want you to see something very similar along the lines of John the Baptist and Isaiah, both men served in spiritual wildernesses. Both men served at a time of moral and spiritual depravity. In both times, God and a love for God was secondary. People primarily focused upon themselves and their way of life. And so too it was in the late 1800s, the late 19th century, When in 1973, a four foot three woman by the name of Lottie Moon felt called into foreign missions and she surrendered her life to Jesus and began serving in the Shandong province of China. Now, you must understand at this time, there was no Lottie Moon Christmas offering. In fact, the first Southern Baptist mission offering that was ever taken was taken in 1888. And do you know how much money was collected? $3,300. Wow! But it was just enough money to send, count them, one, two, three missionaries to China. Seventeen years later, in 1905, the mission agency suffered financial strain. And missionaries were asked to voluntarily cut their pay. I want to share this with you right now. I've never known one missionary to return home a multimillionaire. Ever. Lottie Moon gave what little money she was given by the board. She gave it to the people around her in the Shandong province because to her they were poorer than even she was. In 1912 she'd given so much away that she weighed 50 pounds. Missionaries around her collected enough funds to send her to America to receive treatment for ill health, and she died on the travel back. Friends, following and serving Jesus Christ requires several things. It requires, first, sacrifice. Sacrifice. Jesus says in Luke 14, 26, If any of you want to follow me, you must first hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister. And some of you would say, I have no problem hating my sibling. But that's not what Jesus is saying, okay? And even his own life. Jesus is not talking about 
Literally hating. He's talking about priority. Where does your family stack up in your priority? Is family number one? Or does family fall below God? Because you'll quickly find the first time that family takes the place of God, your priorities are mixed up. And God's not going to bless your life. It requires sacrifice to listen to the voice of God. There's a young man and my former pastor in town. His son was called to preach, or so he said. And so he wanted to talk to me. He was not a member of my church, of a First Baptist Church, but he wanted to talk to me. Because, in their words, I had some learning and I could help him. Okay, I guess. I said, well, tell me about your call and tell me about his call. And I said, well, that's great. I said, let's go to college. I said, and then what I want you to do, I want you to pray about attending seminary. And he said, now, now where's a good seminary? And I said, well, I said, a good seminary is going to be outside of Tennessee. I said, I would encourage you to do that as your next step. His father was very kind and called me one day and said, How dare you tell me, how dare you tell my son that he needs to go away to school. He's got all the schooling he needs. All he needs to do is just preach. Parents and children, I want you to hear this very carefully. The calling in God require, to God requires sacrifice. It requires self-sacrifice wherein you may very well have to leave the city that you were reared in. You may very well have to leave your family in order to serve God faithfully. Are you willing to do that? If He was to call you right now, are you willing to throw away everything? And I, when I say throw it away, not in a bad sense, but are you willing to put that aside and say, yes, Mom, yes, Dad, yes, Grandma, yes, Grandpa, yes, Son, yes, Daughter, I still love you. But God must come first. Did you listen to the woman today? She said, my son, my baby was having problems and I couldn't get to him as a mother. I'm married. I know what my, mom, what my wife wants to do. My wife wants to be with her child. And yet in that moment of grief, what happened? God leads a person to faith in Jesus Christ by climbing a mountain. I want you to know there's no mountain in life that God would ask you to climb that He Himself has not climbed it before you and given you the rope through faith in Jesus Christ to come to where He is. But do you believe for it requires sacrifice to follow Jesus? It also requires an abandonment of worldly possessions. This is meant in no disrespect towards Walmart or any other retailer in the world. But in third world countries, normally they're not Black Friday runs on stores. A run may be at the local market for food. But there are many cultures, folks, where worldly possessions don't matter a whole lot. When we're called to Jesus Christ, what we have cannot be of primary importance. It must be secondary, tertiary, and way down the line. Following Jesus also says to us that we are going to enter into a wilderness. You know what? When you leave Friendship Baptist Church, you will enter the wilderness of Grenada, Mississippi, where people are hurt, where people are broken, where people have affairs daily, where people are drunk, where people are hooked on drugs, where people have lost faith in themselves and so they kill themselves and say life's not worth living. You're going to find a world full of troubles outside of these walls. And for a Christian, you look and you remember what Peter said. He says we are like aliens in this world. Folks, a Christian is like an alien. You know what, like an alien? We come into a culture that doesn't understand us if we're truly this child of God. Well, why aren't you doing what I do? Why don't you think like I think? You're a bigot. You're a hypocrite. You're a racist. Whatever it may be. Fourth, 
Following Christ may very well mean that you suffer. Matthew said, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 22, that if we truly follow Him, we will be hated because of His name. Not because of our name, but because of the name of Jesus. His name is Bruce Moon. This past August, Bruce Moon related to Lottie Moon, wanted to find out more about his distant cousin. And so he went to the Shandong province in China, to the Ping Lai Christian Church. And it just so happened that he went on a Sunday in August when they were celebrating the 100th anniversary of Lottie Moon's death. Now, she died in 1912, so it's 103 years, but he said that didn't matter. What he said was this, the preacher, in his sermon, he couldn't understand a word he was saying, and he, went, he came unannounced, and so no one even knew he was related to Lottie Moon. They just knew he was a white man and didn't speak their language. But he kept saying, Muladi, Muladi, Muladi. You know what Muladi is? Muladi means Lottie Moon in Chinese. And he would look at the children and say, Muladi, and say something to them. And he, he asked a man who spoke broken English, what, what is the pastor saying? He's telling the children to remember what Lottie Moon taught their great great grandparents. And then he would talk. To the adults, and he, he said, what, what is he saying to the adults? And the pastor was pleading with the adults to remember what Mulai D had instilled in them and those they knew. A hundred years later, that four foot three woman's testimony still resonates with people. But do you know what resonates? It wasn't what she did, how she lived, but what resonates is that she gave to them the greatest gift ever. She gave to them the gift of Jesus. I want to ask you a question. This is going to be a very hard question, one of the hardest questions I've ever asked any church that I've ever served, and I've never asked anyone this question but you. I want you to think back in your own families. How many of you can say such and such in my family is still being talked about a hundred years later? You think about it. Such and such is still being talked about in my family 50 years later. Such and my, such and my family is still being talked about five years later. And boy, we have funerals. And we'll talk about what such and such did and how they lived and what they enjoyed and all this. And then suddenly it just seems to go away. At the end of this message today, I want to challenge you in a new way to live. And so a hundred years from now, someone will talk about you, not for what you did, not for where you lived, not for the size deer you shot and put on the wall, but for the testimony that you were for Jesus Christ. And the word was proclaimed by people. Our text tells us, beginning in verse 9, going down to verse 13, or verse, tw verse 11, that our text was also proclaimed through Christ. And I say our text, and you say our text. Yes, our text is Jesus. Look at verse 10. To me, verse 10 is one of the saddest verses in all the Bible. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not Know him. Understand that some people didn't want the message of Jesus. They wanted to do their own thing. Same way today. Others didn't want him. Well, Jesus, you just don't look the way that I want you to look. You don't dress the way I think you should dress. You don't say the things I think you should say. Still, there were some who were looking for other, someone else. They had a preconceived notion as to what Jesus should look like, and he didn't fit the bill. I've had more people in my life say, well, you don't look like a preacher. Wow, what does a preacher look like? Tell me. And then they'll tell me. And yet, you know what? There's still some people who didn't and still who do not know Jesus because they've never heard about Him. People just like those you saw this morning. 
never heard about Jesus. You know, in our minds, guys, that is a foreign concept. Not hearing about Jesus. Where can you not hear about Jesus in this world? You hear about Him everywhere. I mentioned to you, this to me is one of the saddest passages in the Bible. But as a Southern Baptist, something happened this year that grieved my heart. Because of financial woe, the International Mission Board had to recall 800 missionaries from the field. Because the Lottie Moon Christmas offering has been down. And this is where they receive the majority of their funding from missionaries. And by the way, those of you who live, expenses in our lives normally go up or they go down. They normally go up. And if giving doesn't go up, then you can't meet expenses. How many millions of people have been affected because some of us needed flat screen TVs and PlayStations, new clothing, new guns, new cars, additions to our homes, new countertops in the kitchen. Her name was Mary. I had the privilege of preaching her going home service about a year and a half ago. She was not from here. You would not know her. But I used to go to Mary's home and I would sit and drink coffee and eat nuts. She always had nuts and pecans and all those good things in a big bowl for me because she knew that I loved them. And one day as I was there, she did, Mary just started crying. And I said, Miss Mary, what, what's the problem? And she said, Brother Brian, it's what, you, what you've talked about since you've come. And I said, what's, what's that? She said, the whole idea that we need to be telling people about Jesus through missions and evangelism. I said, well, yes, ma'am. She further explained, Brother Brian, I lived in Indiana for many years and was an active member of a Baptist church there. And Brother Brian, I was over the missions team. I decided where the monies were spent. I decided what we did and so forth. But she said, Brother Brian, what's burdening my heart is that I had no idea what I was doing. She said, Brother Brian, I've never one time gone on any kind of mission trip. I've never done anything mission related for Jesus. And they put me in charge of missions. Some of you may be exactly where she was. But I want you to know at Friendship Baptist Church, we believe in evangelism and we believe in missions. In 2016, you as a church have at least three opportunities to participate in a mission trip and mission activities away from Grenada. One is in March. We'll be going to Sinai Baptist Church as we often do. And that is in Matamoros, Mexico, right across the border. It's not but five or six minutes to the church. Some I've heard say, well, I'm just so scared. Listen, I went last year. I never felt threatened. But you know what? If it is my time to go, then I go serving faithfully my Lord. And Jesus says, unless my life is His, then my life is not His. Okay? You have another opportunity in April. I'll get you the dates on that later. It's going to be late April to go to Montana. Now, some of you may say, is Montana another country? No. It may feel like that after we've driven for, I don't know, five, six weeks. Somebody, I think Charles, told me, he said, well, you know, instead of taking a bus, why don't we take a, why don't we take a mule train? We can go up there the old-fashioned way. But Montana, we have an awesome opportunity to partner with the church plan and tell people about Jesus. And then this summer we'll be returning to Sinai Baptist Church for a vacation Bible school. Some of you may say, Brother Brian, I don't have the money to go. I want you to hear me say this. If God is leading you to do something, you have the faith that He will provide and God will provide. Some of you may physically, because of your work schedule, you may not be able to partner with this, with the church family in this, in this regard. But you know what you can do? 
You can take that envelope and you can give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And you can partner with what God is doing worldwide to tell people about His risen Son, Jesus Christ. Because folks, the Word is proclaimed through Jesus Himself. A man had five gallons of paint. Needed to paint his house. and He looked at the paint and thought, I'm not going to have enough. You know what he did? He decided to put water, add water to the paint and thin the paint. Well, man, that made it go farther. Well, guess what happened after the first big rain? Man, it was nasty. That guy's house looked pitiful. Looked like he'd never touched it with an ounce of paint. And the man heard from a voice from above saying, Repaint and thin no more. <laughs> you know what's happened in our culture? The gospel of Jesus Christ has been watered down. So that when difficult times in life do come, people don't fall back on the truth. They fall back on churches and ideologies and preachers and they fall back on themselves. And I want you to know right now, friend, that if you do not fall in the loving arms of Jesus Christ, you will fall. But God is there to catch you, friend. If you would just but put your faith in Him today. Look, Jesus isn't concerned with how much we have. Jesus said about a woman who came to the temple and put in her last two small coins, pennies to us. But he said this woman has given more than anyone because she's given everything. He took five loaves and two fishes and fed almost 20,000 people. God isn't concerned with how much we have to give Him. He is simply concerned with do we have the faith to trust Him with what He's blessed us with. Do you trust God this morning? Mother Teresa said many years ago, we have drugs for people with diseases like leprosy, but these drugs do not treat the main problem. You see, the main problem for a leper is not the leprosy, but the fact that these people are unwanted. Do you know there are unwanted people in our culture today? People who are unwanted by families? by friends, people who are unwanted by businesses. You know, there's some people who are even unwanted by local churches. Verse 12, But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become the children of God. Let me give you four statements. First, anyone can come to Jesus Christ. Anyone may come to Jesus Christ. God is not limited in His scope. He is not limited in His ability to save people. I've had individuals say to me, Brother Brian, I've done too much. No, friend, you've not done too much. God would never forgive me if God can forgive the Roman soldier who crucified Jesus and gave his thumbs up. He will forgive you and me as well. Anyone may come. Second, there's a commitment involved to following Jesus Christ for salvation. The text tells us, but as many as received Him. Now I want you to understand here, the word receive indicates a commitment. It's not a mental assent, but it is an understanding that there is a commitment to what's being asked of you. When I gave my wife a ring many years ago, after she had it appraised and said yes, You know what, ladies, when you place that ri ring on your finger, you're receiving a gift from your husband or your fiancé. But there's an understanding that there is a commitment. A commitment that must be honored. 
Marriage isn't easy. Anyone think marriage is easy? I promise you it's not. It's challenging. It's hard. Sometimes it seems impossible. I tell you something, following Jesus isn't easy. It's hard, difficult. Sometimes we think, Lord, it's just impossible. Well, let me ask you this, same question that Jesus asks. Where is Christ? Is He Lord of your life? Is He the sword of your life? Or is He somewhere in life? Third, the authority is in Jesus. The authority is in Christ Himself. People in America often say, well, I have the right. These are my rights. You know what the Bible says our rights are? For the wages of sin is death. That's what God gives us. He says you have the right to die. You have the right to live as you choose to live. But I want you to know that through that right and that free will, there are consequences for the actions you make. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God comes along and says, you know what, I know that you can exist, and I know that you're going to die if you continue in your sinful life, but it doesn't have to be that way. Listen, you can live, you can live victoriously, you can begin living today with hope, with meaning, with fulfillment, with promise. But in order to do that, verse 13, we must be born again. We're not God's children because of our bloodlines. God doesn't stud out spiritual Christians. Jesus' bloodline, by the way, was imperfect. Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, Abraham was a good, he was a good old liar. He didn't trust God several times in his life. Judah, well, Judah, for whom the southern kingdom is named and from whom which tribe Jesus springs from, Judah was a sexually immoral man. David, David was oftentimes selfish in his ministry. David was consumed with the flesh. His son Solomon was so entrenched by women, the Bible says in 2 Kings, that eventually all of these wives drove his heart far away from the heart of God. Don't ever pray, by the way, for the wisdom of Solomon. Pray for the wisdom of Jesus. King Uzziah, he was a good king, the Bible says. But you know what? In one instance in his life, King Uzziah walked into the Holy of Holies. He said, I am going to offer sacrifice. And you know what God said as a result of that? No, this is not your specific role in which you're to serve me. You've disobeyed me. You've shown flagrantly your disobedience. And he blessed him with leprosy. And Uzziah died shortly thereafter. The point is this. Jesus' own bloodline is imperfect. All of humanity is imperfect. But praise God for the manger because Jesus was born perfect. He was born by a virgin, never having known a man physically. But the Bible says the Holy Spirit implanted the seed in her to us. We can't understand that. We can't wrap our minds around it. But you understand that the entire gospel hinges on the virgin birth. If Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, it all ends there. It's over. We're not God's children because of our works. The Bible says that we were saved by, are saved by grace through faith. I'm not a child of God because of my life. I'm a child of God because of Jesus Christ. And the word was proclaimed by people through Christ and for our salvation. And I close with this. The young man's name was William Borden. William Borden was the heir apparent to the Borden estate. How many of y'all have ever had Borden milk products? Well, William Borden graduated high school and in the early 20th century. He began to travel with his parents. 
They went to Asia, to China, to Europe, and the Middle East, and something happened with William Borden. He began to have a burden for people. And so one day, he committed to the Lord that he was going to be faithful to God, and he was going to be a missionary. And so he took his Bible, as you and I might have today, and he took a pen in the back of that Bible, and he wrote the words, no reserves. No reserves. Simply stating, you know what, it's not the money. Why? It's not because of the money that I live. Money can do nothing. But Jesus is my reserve. He is my wealth. He is my inheritance. He went on to Yale, where he attended college. After he finished college, well, let, let me share this, while he was in college, he started a small Bible study, which grew to over 1,300 people. And you know what the one purpose of that Bible study was? That every person on the campus of Yale University would hear and have the opportunity to respond to Jesus Christ. After he finished his studies, being the son of the Borden family, he had multiple business opportunities that were afforded to him. Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? And William Borden said no. But God placed upon his heart a burden for a specific people group known as the Kanzu people in China, a primarily Muslim-speaking people. So William Borden again opened up his Bible and he wrote the words, no retreats, meaning that he was going full-fledged ahead with serving Jesus Christ and he wasn't looking back. From now on it was Jesus and Christ alone. Borden enrolled at seminary, but again because the people to whom he was going to be ministering spoke Muslim, or spoke, excuse me, spoke primarily Arabic. He went to Cairo, Egypt, where he entered a school to learn Arabic. Not long after that, he contracted spinal meningitis, and he died, never having the opportunity to serve the Kanzu people. A while after that, someone was looking through his possessions, and they found that Bible. Because of the physical condition his body had succumbed to, he was still able to write just a little. And at the back of that Bible, there was one last phrase, and it said, No regrets. No reserves. No retreats. And no regrets. I want to challenge you today to live your life in that manner. Saying no reserves. Money is not what I live for. Possessions are not what identify me. But Jesus Christ is my inheritance. And in Him I place my complete and full trust. No retreats. Some of you need to look straight ahead instead of looking back because I want you to something. I want you to know something. When we struggle with sinful lifestyles, Satan is always going to have us doing this. Instead of looking at Jesus, he's going to have us looking in the opposite direction and where we've been. Saying, you need to go back there because you're not worthy to go here. Listen, friend, if you've struggled with alcohol, with drug abuse, with pornography, with anything in your life, you've struggled with the flesh, you've struggled with selfishness, you've struggled with theft, I want you to make a commitment to God today. And you say, Lord, no retreats in my life, but from now on, Jesus, the cross, Him crucified and risen indeed. Finally, no regrets. You see, friend, it's not going to be people a hundred years from now who remember that deer you killed. They're not going to remember your place of employment 
Because most likely your place of employment won't be around. Most of them probably won't remember where you lived. But oh, I pray they would remember how Jesus Christ worked through you. You see, that's the testimony that continues on. Satan can try and wipe us out, but he can never wipe out the testimony of Jesus Christ. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. Would you bow your heads this morning? The most important question you'll ever be asked Would you say to the Lord today, Lord, I know that in my life that I have sinned, that I've fallen short of doing what you want me to do and following your son the way I need to follow him and surrendering my life completely. Lord God, I know that I've sinned. I know that my life has fallen short. All the stuff I've thought of most important, somehow, Lord, all that's let me down. And today, God, I'm simply saying to you, no reserves. Friend, would you come to the cross today and give your life to Jesus Christ and allow Him to save you and to save you completely? Because when God saves, He doesn't save a portion of you. He doesn't save 99.9%. He saves all of you. Would you then say, God, I don't want to retreat any longer. I don't want to look back. but I want to look to Jesus. Friends, when we do go to the cross, we will find that Jesus does turn us around 180 degrees. But He turns us around so that we see people as He sees them people who are lost and dying without a shepherd. And he asks us to return with his blessing, with his spirit, and bring them to the cross as well. And finally, friend, at the end of your life, would you be able to say there are no regrets? I've never, ever read nor heard a suicide note that read in this way, my life was a success, people loved me, how blessed and how wonderful it was to live on this earth. Life is worth living when it's lived for Jesus. Oh, today would you come? Would you come and give your life? Because one day when you and I stand before God, it may very well be that you have not responded to the gospel. Friend, you had your time on this earth. I would not want you to have the greatest regret of all and that's not asking Jesus to forgive you of your sin to take over your life. Because the Bible says the wages of death of sin is death and that is eternal death in hell. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Friends, some of you know people in Grenada. Some of you have family members who are dying right now without faith in Christ. I know our altar this morning is filled with flowers and we have our handbells, but there's always room to pray at the altar. Would you come and would you lift up those people in prayer? Some of you perhaps need to come this morning and pray about a calling that God may be giving you. If you're a Christian today, God has called you to be a missionary. It may not be in a foreign field, but He has called you to be faithful to Him right here and everywhere you are in your life. God may have led you to Friendship Baptist Church to unite with us in membership. If God is leading you to do that, would you come today? Wherever the Spirit of God is leading, be faithful and say to the Lord, no reserves, no retreats, and no 
the grips. Father God, every one of us need to live our lives in that way. And when we stand before you, that prayerfully, Lord Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. God, there's some this morning who don't feel worthy of salvation. I was there. Even being a Christian for well over 20 years, almost 30 years now, there are days when I don't feel worthy. But the fact is I'm worth so much more than I ever could imagine because you sent your son to die on an old wooden cross for a sin-stained person like me. Thank you that your love has given me worth. Thank you that Jesus has given purpose. And I pray today that those who need Christ would come, would receive Him, and be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have a time to respond. A time to say, yes, Lord. But what will you say? Brother Ken's going to come and lead us. You respond to what God is saying to you as we stand and as we sing.